Hello, my name is Sarah Cook. I'm the director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. Um, and UNRIST is a small research institute with a mandate to undertake research on social dimensions of development. Um, and much of the issues that I'm going to be talking about now draw on some of our work in this field. So in setting the stage for these two days of the session, training session on social inclusion and the post-2015 agenda, um, what I want to do is set an overall stage, provide a, a framework um, for the discussion of a range of issues um, which are often referred to as social within the sustainable development discussion. And what I really want is first to provide a short definition, then to make three main points, which I just want you to take away as the key messages, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail to elaborate on these. Um, so the definition, I want to say what I think social development is about, and what UNRIS talks about as social development. And we talk about it as a process of structural change through which individuals and social groups gain improvements in their well-being, um, their rights compatible with justice. And as such, this is less about only individuals, their health, their education, um, water, sanitation, food, etc., all of which are components of that. But it's much more about the process of structural change, changes in social structures, changes in social relations, class relations, gender relations, ethnicity, etc., and in institutions. And it's also about both processes of change and about the outcomes that we achieve. And so that definition of social development in itself, I think, starts to point us away from just a focus on individuals, the poor, the vulnerable, to really thinking about society. So the three key points and messages that I hope you'll take away from this. The first is that an agenda of sustainable development requires us to look not at separate pillars, as we've often talked about pillars, uh, the social, economic, environmental pillars of development, but rather it requires us to think about these sort of domains as very much interconnected and to focus on the synergies between them, the complementarities, but also the trade-offs. And so I think, you know, in other words, we can't think meaningfully about social policies or social inclusion um, in isolation from economic policies, economic and even political inclusion. My second key point um, as a takeaway message is that reducing poverty and generating inclusive societies cannot be achieved only through a focus exclusively or even primarily on the poorest or poorest or vulnerable groups. So social dimensions or issues um, need to focus not just on the poor, not just to target the poor. And that means not really the narrow, more narrowly focused MDG agenda, but rather they need to think about universal approaches that can bring together all groups in society to work across all classes and all ethnic, gender, class, etc. groups. And my third key point are that there are effective instruments for more sustained and inclusive development. And I'm going to discuss these in more detail under the heading of transformative social policies. So in our background note, we briefly discussed the concept of social inclusion or an inclusive society. Um, I won't go into more detail here, you have that note. But there's no doubt that inclusive or cohesive societies are essential underpinnings, the foundations, and even really the drivers of social, economic, and environmental sustainability. So of what we're trying to achieve in terms of sustainable development. And so for this, I think, I would argue, we need an approach to sustainable development that goes beyond the kind of selective or targeted approach reflected particularly in the MDGs, but also in many other policy instruments. So for example, cash transfers, conditional cash transfers, have been very popular as instruments, and they are important instruments for social protection, but they've dominated discussions of social policies. And what I want to suggest is that we need to look at additional um, instruments. Those are important, but not sufficient. And I want to highlight two key shifts that we've seen in this development from the MDGs to a post-2015 or sustainable development agenda that I think are particularly relevant here. The first is that we're now more concerned with issues of inequality, in part because, as we've all seen globally, there are social and political manifestations of inequality um, which have arisen from the degrees of, of you know, unacceptable or unjust levels. 
And this is not just about income inequality, but that re attracts most attention, but it's also about other forms of social um, inequality and deprivation that I think we all know about. And these are both social, economic, and political. They're about relations of power as well as um, other forms of exclusion. In addition to inequality, the second major change, I think, is that we've recognized that the MDGs focus too narrow, narrowly on social issues, and that now we need to look more at the relationship between the social issues and the productive economy. Um, we cannot just look at, for example, health, education, or issues of concern to women, separate from issues of labor markets, employment, or even macroeconomic and sectoral issues. So now the post-2015 agenda, the sustainable development agenda as these come together, is more concerned with issues of equality, inequality, moving to equality, and exclusion than were the MDGs. And it's more concerned with this relationship between social and economic policies or between social and productive policies, as well as with the environment. So what kind of policy instruments are available to address these intersectoral challenges? Let me highlight one largely neglected policy area. And this, again, comes from a large body of research. Um, and in this research, we've drawn attention to what we've called transformative social policy. And what we're essentially referring to here are policies in the social domain that have the potential to contribute to the kinds of transformation in economic and social relations of production, of consumption, of distribution that can then lead to sustainable development outcomes. And the evidence for such policies comes from a range of successful case studies. These are not sort of recent cases necessarily related to, say, the MDGs, but rather they come from a range of historical experiences from the Nordic countries in the early 20th century, the East Asian industrializing economies in the mid 20th century, but also a range of countries in the global south, such as Costa Rica and Mauritius. And there are many other examples, and there are also examples of success cases that have then fallen backwards for different reasons. But what was important in these success stories was not just economic policies or poverty-focused interventions, but rather it was the nature of social policies that contributed to broad-based economic development and transformation through a number of key functions or roles. And again, these are elaborated in a box in the um, background note that you have received. And we talk about four key functions of social policy. The first is protection, or one of them is protection. And we, that is the function that we're talking about most when we're talking about the MDG agenda, when we're talking about social policies today. It's about social protection. And you'll hear more about that in terms of the social protection floor. That's important, but what we argue that if you want social policy to contribute to economic transformation, you need to pay attention to other issues. One, as I've mentioned, is production, and this means enhancing the productive potential of individuals, for example, through health, education, training, active labor market policies. A second is distribution, and this obviously means addressing um, policy, uh, addressing processes that lead to unequal distribution of wealth, income, or other factors. And a third um, is reproduction, and I'll say more about this. Others would also add here that social policy has a role to play in nation building or state building and the creation of cohesive societies, which obviously is important um, also. I think increasingly we're also being challenged to think of how such policies can contribute to more sustainable consumption and production patterns in an environmentally constrained world. So let me just emphasize four key points about this framework of thinking about new forms of social policies that can help towards a transformative agenda. First, as I've said, social policy cannot just be about protection, uh, protecting the poorest and most vulnerable. It also relates to how people are integrated into labor and other markets, whether they receive decent wages, whether they have opportunities for education and health to become productive members of societies. The second is about distribution. An inclusive or cohesive society needs to think about the distributional impacts, not just of social protection policies, of, of the expenditure side of social 
policies, but also about the revenue raising side. For example, the distribution of taxes, what types of taxes, whether they fall on labor or capital, whether they fall on individual incomes on corporations. These have huge implications for um, distribution. Um, third, where we've seen social policies contribute to inclusive development, it happens through processes that are more universal rather than targeted. Um, this kind of universalism means that all people, middle classes for example, can see that they can receive some benefits but they need to pay taxes. So you have a political or a social contract which brings people together in more cohesive um, ways. And finally, um, in many ways the most neglected area uh, in the social protection and the post-2015 debate from a social perspective is the function of reproduction. And by reproduction I mean um, both the issues related to childbirth, looking after children, a r wide range of care work, what's sometimes called the care economy, um, looking after children, the sick, the disabled, the um, elderly, as well as the, work of, the daily work of reproduction, educating, feeding, clothing, cleaning, that means that people go to work healthy and productive. And all of these are essential inputs into productive labor and thus important for economic development needs. Um, a broader notion of social reproduction would also include issues related to civic education involved in creating citizens and thus generating inclusive or cohesive societies. We know broadly that this work of social reproduction is undertaken predominantly by women. In many countries it's predominantly unpaid work and therefore it's been neglected in many policy debates. Um, it has many implications, obviously, for the inclusion of women and often children in low-income societies, in society, in the productive economy, in labour markets, as well as having implications for their own well-being and equality. And there are many basic policies that can assist in overcoming essential barriers to inclusion in this respect. These include basic infrastructure, water, sanitation, um, public transport, but also specific care services, creches, health services, and also properly paid employment um, for care, childcare, nursing, um, often in sectors which employ women. So if women are then employed with decent work, this has positive effects for their families and households. Um, I think many of these issues that I've raised now will recur in subsequent sessions. Uh, these are tasks, these care tasks, these issues of distribution of the link between social and productive sectors are essential for many of the other areas you'll hear about, um, achieving food security and nutrition, for educating future generations, for a functioning health service, etc. But these are often discussed as separate sectors or in silos or separate from each other. And I think what we're really trying to emphasize here is that we need to look, there are very specific policies we can pursue, but we need to look at the interactions between them and how they interact and take a more holistic view of society and economy. And in conclusion then, I'd just like to draw attention to one of the briefs that UNRISD has um, produced. It produced for the Commission for Social Development, and it's titled The Social Drivers of Sustainable Development. And I think in this, many of the issues that I've mentioned here are also summarized. And we also highlight the role of social structures, institutions, and agency, issues of participation and empowerment in ach achieving more inclusive societies. Um, so I hope you look at this and our other post-2015 briefs and other UNRIS materials as background, I think, to understanding what we think is an important element in framing the debate about social inclusion, inclusive societies for a post-2015 agenda. Thank you.